Welcome to Beyond the Inbox, an e-commerce podcast brought to you by Drip. In each episode, you'll hear from top e-commerce marketers and founders who will reveal the customer-first strategies they're using to grow their sales, subscribers, and revenue. Now let's get into today's episode. In this episode of Beyond the Inbox, I'm joined by Michelle Songi, founder of Presshook. Michelle shares her experience as a tech startup founder and how it led her to create Presshook, a platform that helps small businesses and startups gain media exposure. We discuss the importance of storytelling and affiliate marketing in PR, and Michelle offers valuable insights into how smaller e-commerce brands can compete with larger companies. Tune in to hear more about Michelle's journey and the future of PR in the digital age. Enjoy. Michelle, welcome to Beyond the Inbox. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you. Glad to be here. I want to start with your background. I know that you were a tech founder in a previous life, and I was doing some research on you before our recording, and I know you spent some time in a remote part of Indonesia, and you told the story about talking to a local business owner about ideas to get him more media exposure. You called that trip the trip of a lifetime. Can you tell me about that experience? Sure. So about five or six years ago, I read an article um, on Culture Trip when I was doing some research on the best places in the world to go diving. And I read about this super remote place that was absolutely almost impossible to get to. Um, and of course, when I was like working, I never had enough time off. So I finally got a little sabbatical after leaving the last company um, I was working with and decided that it was time for me to go explore this place, like this, this image and this um, cute little like b and in the middle of uh, Raja and Pot, Indonesia just caught my eye. And I said, I have to go there one day. I have to go. So I decided to go by myself and it was multiple planes boats, um, and rides to get there. Um, it took a few days and I finally got there, um, went completely off the grid. I remember my mom said that all of a sudden I just had no location. I was just in the middle of the ocean somewhere (laughs) and I get there and it was a hundred times more than anything I've, I've ever uh, imagined. And, and I, and I'm on this tiny little Island again, middle of nowhere, no, like really electricity and service or anything. And I asked the guy and like the first thing the guy asked me, we're like talking, having dinner. And he says, how'd you, how'd you like, we just love to know how'd you end up here? Like, how'd you hear about us? And I said, I, I read about it in this article in culture trip a couple of years ago. And I just always wanted to come here. And he said, you know, that's crazy. I, I can't tell you how many customers we have that come from that one article. We probably get more customers from there than anywhere else besides referrals, people just coming back and hearing about it. And, you know, I, I, we talked and I, you know, was thinking about my next move, what I was even going to do next. And I, we talked about, you know, how do you get more of this kind of like media coverage? It's so powerful to a small business. And I struggled with it before too, having big competitors. And we just started talking and he, you know, we tried to think of like other ways how we could get this again. And I really said like, it is difficult. Like you either have to figure out how to do it yourself and learn it, be educated on, or have the contacts and network, or you have to pay someone a lot of money to do it. So we connected over that. That's a good segue into you founded Presshook in an effort to solve the problems you yourself faced as a tech startup founder with a limited marketing and PR budget. Can you tell me more about how those experiences shaped how Presshook helps its customers? Sure. So the idea was looking back is we were kind of trying to replicate almost like an Airbnb mall at first. We were trying to create a marketplace. So if we know that journalists have to write new content, come up with new ideas, and they get assigned stories every day, how do we how do we land at the right time, right place, right? So we decided to create a marketplace. So on one side, there's businesses and brands that create profiles. These are essentially their press kits, media kits, but um, digitalized. So once they're on there, now a journalist, when they do get assigned a story or they're just discovering, looking for something interesting new to talk about, they come on the site, use it like a little Google search engine, type in the keywords and automatically find those brands or products or people that they can speak with for their stories. 
um, giving them more acts like, you know, uh, democratizing access to, to them, you know, giving them more diverse sources than they would just know through their own networks and their own research. Um, and then also obviously giving a, making a very cost efficient solution for startups and small businesses. There's a lot I want to unpack and I think I'll come back to that in a moment. One thing that stood out for me when I was reading about your story was you were very hands-on when you were working at your previous startup and you found media outreach to be time-consuming and often fruitless. What mistakes do small e-commerce brands make when it comes to PR? Sure. I think, you know, I, people try their hands at it in different ways. Um, a lot of them just come in doing it, just saying, you know, maybe we just email everybody or how do we know who to email? And they might not have time and effort even and the knowledge to know how to email people, when to email people, knowing that they're, this is like a person on their side with a job. It's not just a publication you're blasting. Um, so I think people just do it at first just to see what works. And I think that's like a part of us being startups and founders is we just try something and see what happens. Um, but it's, it's not really done in a very thoughtful, very meaningful way. Um, and that's what you need to do if you actually want someone to respond. So I would say treat it the same way you would treat, um, your own BD to get in touch with your own, um, retailers or suppliers. You want to make a personal connection. You want to get to know who are the people you really want to make connections with, build a relationship with. Um, and eventually, hopefully get them to, you know, tell your story or think of you and include you when they do have a relative story. Um, so I, I think it's really understanding one, like, who is your, where is your audience? Like, where, which you, you might really want to be in the New York Times or Forbes, but like your, your audience might not be, your customers might not be reading that. They're reading some other publications. So figuring out really where, who is your audience and, uh, and where are they? targeting those publications, but then also within that publication, there's a lot of writers. There's, there's staff writers, there's um, contributors, there's the edit editors. So we're getting to know those people um, and making a connection with them and saying, hi, I'm so-and-so, I'm a founder, a marketer, and I'd love to introduce myself and share with you our brand, our products. And also, why are you sharing this with them now? Why is it, why why now? Why is this relevant right now to them? So it's really about the, the timeliness of why you're writing them and why that's important today. Timeliness is something that I also want to come back to when we talk about gift guides a little bit later on. We started this call with a story and you mentioned story a little bit earlier on as well. What role does brand storytelling play in PR? How can more brands leverage their found a story in reaching out to some of these media outlets? Um, right now, it's more important than ever before. Finding that good story, figuring it out, really connecting and understanding like yeah, why, why you did start something and how that can connect with your customers, especially for like the Gen Z generation. Like it's really about the story. They want to understand um, why did you start it? Is it because some sustainability or effort that you saw, or is there this really gap in the market or what are the competitors doing? You're not, um, do you have a personal experience that they can connect to and understand? So it just, I mean, the product is one piece, um, but really the story can get you, you can get you there and get you coverage and get you a connection faster. Um, so I, yeah, building the brand story is just as important as building your products. Are there any brand stories that come to mind, some favorites that are doing really well right now when it comes to PR? Um, you know, oh, I can think of so many. <laughs> I'll pull some from our website and see what I have. But anything about, um, you know, maybe you had a ma anything from like, you know, parents or a sickness or an experience you went through, Um you know, I, I think people love hearing, you know, especially the, the startup stories of you starting something in your backyard and with your mom and like some funny story of what happened. Um, you know, I, I think just making it personal to like what the what what the problem was or what the issue was, the core issue that that you dealt with and that being more emotional tied. Um, it's hard to be put on the spot on this, but <laughs> there's so many I've read that are so great. 
Um, but yeah, I, I think definitely tying it back to you as a person and, and how you really realized and figured that out. I think one of my favorites that comes to mind, and I might be biased in saying this because I wrote an article about them many years ago, but the men's grooming brand Harry's, because there was very much a David versus Goliath story in the marketing where they started the brand because they felt like men were overpaying for razors. And I believe they were one of the first subscription offers for razors, but that's a brand story that sticks in my mind. And it's interesting when I was writing this article and I was looking at some of the links that they were attracting, it wasn't necessarily about the product or the business model. It was about these two guys that came together and decided to go up against, I think it was Gillette. That was the Goliath in the story. And that's just something that stayed with me for a long time. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. I mean, and it's so, and it's true. And if it's true and it resonates and it's authentic, it just feels so much better. Um, and it's hard, like not maybe no one, everyone has like a crazy story like that. So like figure out what is something meaningful because you're going to be telling the story over and over and over again. So like whatever feels good, lights you up, really gets you like passionate and going like that should be your story. Do you think it's more common for bigger media outlets to tell the story of the founder or the co-founder versus the creation of a product? That's usually, it's always where it begins, right? It's where we started, <laughs> you know, how does this begin? Why this start? And then you go and it leads into the product. Um, but at, at first, yes, we try products and, you know, we try and taste things and we like them. And then you kind of want to understand like, whoa, well, you, did you hear, did you hear the story about how this product came about? Did you hear this? So I think it's like you, it depends where you started, but a lot of times we do start off looking and seeing a product and then we then develop, you know, that understanding of, who they are, where they came from through, you know, being more involved with them, being customers. Um, but yeah, I think it's it good. Again, it goes hand in hand, but um, further as you, as you go, probably people get more interested in your story um, and then develop into your product. Speaking of attracting backlinks from big media sites, you wrote in one article, I believe this was on the Press Hook website, you wrote, in today's digital age, earned media is nearly impossible to garner without affiliate marketing. Tell me more about that. Why is it so important? Especially for e-commerce brands, <laughs> anything in the CPG space. Um, this really came about, I mean, it really started taking over a couple years ago, um, becoming something that we started to see and get asked for on the editorial side. Um, there's still some people confused, like, is this bias? Is this not like, what, what is this? Why do they keep asking for affiliate links? Um, it, it is a way that these publications are making a revenue. You know, like some of them are writing a story that has super high SEO. I've heard stories of some, like the best comfy couches going live and, and they sell millions of dollars through these. So it, they, they're pushing hard. They have great writers, but it's like, instead of just them flipping on a bunch more ads and paywalls and subscriptions, like this is an organic way. They still choose the products they want to write about. But in the end of the story, they do want to put those links in the affiliate program because they're getting back a little kickback from that story and the readership and the credibility that you're getting for that. Um, so I personally think it's such a win-win for the industry. You've never seen, I mean, right now, every media company has an e-commerce team. They have an e-commerce portal. They're writing product reviews, product roundups. Um, they know that it's working. It's connecting to customers. It's selling products. It's working really closely with brands. And again, not just in like pay us X amount for one, you know, sponsored post or an advertisement that's, you know, it's really a lot more meaningful. It feels more organic. Um, it is in and, you know, they, they can, and then you can work with them. If you put publication you're working with, you start selling a lot through, then you can work with them and offer them a higher percentage. And they'll hopefully continuously, you know, keep working with you on a closer basis because you guys are both benefiting out of that. And you're really connecting to the readers who are your customers. Um, so affiliate marketing is in the PR and editorial space is more important than ever. If you don't have one, I wouldn't even do it. <laughs> Um, it's just that important and it, and it really means something to the publication too, that you're giving them, you're offering them something in return. When I see list posts like best 
mattresses 2023. If I'm reading an article like that through the eyes of a small e-commerce brand, it's very easy to feel like it's impossible to compete with these other more established brands. And my question for you is, how can small e-commerce brands with affiliate programs compete with these larger companies that can maybe offer larger percentages with their affiliate programs? Is there a way that they can stand out and compete? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're constantly looking to reinvent, to add new, and they're looking for new products, new businesses to add. They don't want to just keep adding the big corporate ones that everyone talks about. They're constantly looking and finding what's new, what they can recommend next. So if you can find and you write down all those articles, those really high SEO articles that you want to be in, the 10 best, this best, this best, they update them every year too, or some of them update every quarter. Um, so just finding those writers and those articles and contacting them and letting them know you exist and you would love for them to test out your product. And this is why um, that is more than worth it. I can't even tell you how it is. And they do look for those people. They, they're looking for those products because their editors are asking them to keep them updated. Um, they might write when it publishes, you know, the next day, they're not going to update the story. It already went live. Don't ask them to do that. They'll get annoyed, but let them know that you're there. You exist. And as long as you're sending them a relevant pitch, because it's about something they write about, that is fine. That, that is what they want is to hear from more types of products that, that fit what they, what they write about. Um, but you, there's absolutely a chance. I see it every day and they might have some relationships with some bigger brands. That's fine, but they have to fill up their stories. For any smaller e-commerce brands that are listening to this episode, what are some of the characteristics of an attractive affiliate program from the perspective of a larger media site that might cover them in an article? So there's a few programs that are all in our, um, that are all connected to Skimlink. Some of those are like Share, Sale, Impact, uh, Partnerize, um, AWIN, and you can look those up. So there's a few programs that are connected to Skimlinks, and that's the main uh, affiliate network that that all the publication, most of the big publications use. So as long as you get on one of those main programs, um, it's up to you. They all have like different pricing and needs depending on how much affiliate. Um, uh, a commit, you know, revenue and links you're doing out for them. Some are really good for younger brands and startups that are just getting started. Um, some are better when you start pu uh, pushing a lot more transactions through, they make more sense and they're more advanced. Um, but they're, yeah, there's a handful out them, pick one, look at them, compare their prices and sign up. A lot of them also are on the Shopify app marketplace. So you can just search them and it's, there's an automatic integration there. So it's super simple. It takes a day or two total. We talked a little bit earlier about gift guides and you will typically see best products 2023 and so on. Are there any other types of content that e-commerce brands can go after other than gift guides, reviews, and so on? So let's think. So there are obviously the product roundups, um, best things to buy for Mother's Day, um, top trending, you know, products on TikTok for XYZ. So the product roundups are one style. Product reviews is an individual review you can get written up. Um, those are definitely harder uh, to get. And again, that comes down to timeliness. Why are they right? They have so many people pitching them and everybody wants a big product review. Why now? Why do they have to write about you right now? Um, maybe you're offering them an exclusive before the product is actually launched and going to market. Um, they love that. They love being the first and the first one to break a story. Again, it helps them in their SEO and their rankings. Um, so you just have to really think about connecting to them and really finding that right person that can maybe break or take your product launch. Um, and, and, and that can be a really obviously amazing feature to get. Um, so there's product roundups, there's features, there's trend stories, just being a part of a, a trend that's happening in the market and they contact you. Um, another big thing is just day to day and something on our platform too, is journalists are constantly just looking for expert sources. They're looking for sustainability experts or fashion experts, um, lifestyle experts, um, on a broad range of subjects. So if you can just get connected to them in that way and for them to see and know you and you helped like provide some, commentary to their story now they have a connection to you 
they know you and maybe you talked and you told them some other things and then you can start, you know, building that relationship and they can think about you for future stories. So I do think, you know, having someone in the company, whether that's the founder or a CMO or someone else um, that, that can really talk on behalf of the industry and not just really just being there to pitch yourself, but be there to help them craft their stories on some important topics. So that's another way. I'm sat here listening to this and I'm thinking this all sounds great, but at the same time, I'm reflecting back on my own experiences of doing link building and contacting editors and understanding how much time it takes. How can small e-commerce brands make this part of their weekly process where they're actively trying to get more PR, especially when you have to be so timely in doing it? Yeah, it's definitely not. It's quality over quantity. I've learned that after many years. Um, it's not about blasting. It's not about, you know, the, trying to do something really quick, really fast, just to see if you get a quick response or a quick, um, story made. Uh, and we too, at, at press up, we provide a lot of these like PR one-on-one courses and structures. Um, it's a few pitches. It comes down to, we would say like even a max of 10 every week that you can do a quality targeted, nice pitch to an editor. Again, the same as if you're emailing the procurement um, director at Whole Foods or Sephora or somewhere, like think about how you'd craft an email to them. Same way. You can take a couple hours every week to someone on your team can to write very quality targeted pitches once a week, maybe do one round of follow up with them. And that's it. It's not, it's not as, as difficult as it seems. Um, but it's also hard when, you know, if you're out there doing that, that's why there's, you know, platforms like us that exist because we can help, get journalists to uh, come to you in return to by, by seeing you and knowing who you are on, on a daily basis. Um, so I think there's still, no matter what proactive outreach is important to it, there's no reason not to. Um, but there's, there's also other tools out there that can also help you maximize and get more coverage. I'm guessing knowing when certain promotions or rather holidays are coming up is going to help inform when you do this outreach so if you know valentine's day is coming up and there is a good product fit with some of the content that media sites are writing about you know that maybe in january you want to start pitching certain outlets and i'm guessing the same with black friday and christmas you want to be ahead of everyone else and have well am i on the right track would that be fair to say uh, you're a little bit late to the game. <laughs> you start oh, even, pitching. Even, okay. Um, we typically do about, say, to do about three months out. And you start three months out at least. And then you can work your way in because there's going to be last minute stories up until the week before Valentine's Day. Um, so mostly we start seeing media get stories assigned around three months out. Some can be even further, um, especially if it's print. That's going to be six months out. Um, then for Christmas and holidays, that's the only one that's a lot different. That starts in July. Wow. Some would even choose. So you need to get ready. You need your holiday gifts and gift guides ready in the summertime. I would get them ready in June and be ready to pitch in July. Even if they're not live on your site, obviously, and they're not ready to go, you still need to get, they start, they start landing those. I would say by October, most of them are finished. Uh, writing them and November and December, they're doing the last minute quick gift guides for last minute, what, what you can buy very quickly. So they need to know what gifts can be shipped super fast and who has inventory left even. That's really fascinating to hear, Michelle, because I feel like being organized would give you such a competitive edge over maybe some of the bigger brands that have the budget but maybe don't have the same organization as maybe a smaller more scrappy brand so i think that's quite inspiring to hear actually yeah oh yeah now i hear all the time and i didn't know too before that someone said you know emailed us the week before super bowl being like we have this huge release we're doing on this app um, we want to get it out it has so much to do uh, you know so much week coverage is potential for the super bowl and i'm like a week but like you should have started that a year ago <laughs> just no you're you're out of time they're already working on stories in three months um, so yeah, it's just understanding how a publication is built, doing a little research, uh, little guides. Again, there's a lot out, there's a lot of um, resources out there, but that, I think that's, you're right. It's what it's all about. It's about timing. It's about understanding and, and structure to this world because it, it is different and you need to understand how it is if you want to do it right and get the most out of it. Let's assume that our 
fictional small e-commerce brand, they land a nice backlink from a big media site and they're getting some earned media and some nice exposure. What are some of the things that they can do to really make the most of it outside of taking the brand's logo and putting it on their website and saying as featured by and so on? Yep. I mean, putting on your website, obvious. Um, use it in, so obviously, talk about it in your social media. Um, a lot of times we see people using it as an advertisement themselves to acquire customers. Um, email your existing customers for retention. Tell them, like, Harper's Bazaar just said, um, you know, you buy this, but this is the best new product for moms for Mother's Day. Um, they, like, let your customers see and know because they'll be excited for you. They want, you know, to know they own this product and now it's being written about and other reasons that it could be used for in the future. So it gives them ideas of what products you have and what those uses could be for it. Um, so we see a lot of people doing well in using it in their own customer emails for attention. Um, what else? Obviously, adding on your LinkedIn, adding to discussions, um, putting it in your sales decks, putting it in your marketing decks, putting it in your investor decks. Make sure to uh, update when you do your monthly or quarterly investor updates, list the press you've gotten in, sh share it with your investors, let them reshare it on their networks, and they will. They love seeing that. I know that. Um, another reason we see people doing it is if they are um, looking to get into like a retailer or someone big, they might forward their publication, forward their press to them to show them like, hey, look at us, like look what we just got in. Um, that's exciting. And, you know, you, you just constantly want to be sharing it like and show it off like it is a big achievement and share it with not just your mom and dad, you know, like share it with as many people as you can. And there's plenty of networks out there, plenty of uses for it um, internally as well. And obviously it's exciting for your team to see. Michelle, I'm cognizant of our time soon coming to an end. One question I wanted to ask you before we start wrapping up is you recently launched an AI powered press release generated tool. And I wanted to ask you about that. Sure. Um, so obviously there's lots of good ways and bad ways we're seeing that um, ChatGPT could be used. And, but we did find some really useful ways that it can be used, uh, especially for small brands and businesses. And people like me before, like I, I still to this day can barely tell you how to write a press release. There is a structure in a way. I'm not a good writer. I didn't even get into my journalism school or English school. So I'm, you know, that, that makes me nervous writing something like that. Um, but this tool is amazing because it literally prompts you and tells you what is um, what to put it, what what facts and things it needs from you, like to get you put in a little bit about your brand, about the launch, why you're launching, um, what's it for, and it does develop an entire press release for you. Um, we also have something similar that helps you pitch, um, so it can actually help you write a media pitch as well. Um, the press release generator is free. You get a few free uses. Um, check it out. Google um, AI press release generator. And I think we're the top result right now. Uh, but it, it really just helps you figure out the structure. It, it's And it writes it pretty nicely. I still advise, like, you definitely need to look over it, make some edits. It might throw some things in there. It has a mind of its own. Um, but, you know, it's a good structure and place to start from. Make some edits and, and send it out and see what happens. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. I've really enjoyed it, Michelle. Where can our listeners go to learn more about Presshook? Our website is presshook.com. That's P-R-E-S-S-H-O-O-K.com. Perfect. Well, thanks again for taking the time to join us and best of luck with Presshook and everything else. Thank you so much. Really appreciate this interview and hope to see some of you guys soon. Thanks, Michelle. All right, thanks. You've been listening to Beyond the Inbox, an e-commerce podcast brought to you by Drip. If you enjoyed the episode, it would mean the world to me if you would subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes. Thanks for listening.